Yeah, Bas Shalom, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Tyler Utkoff, and I am the online host for Epic Life Church. We are so glad you're here. And before we get into today's message from Pastor Mike on the letter to the Hebrews, let's go over a few things real quick. If you would like to be a part of our thriving and awesome online community, then send me an email at tyler at epiclifetarot.com, or you can just go to the website, epiclifetarot.com, click on the global tab, answer a few questions, and we'll get you connected as soon as possible. And you can also request to be added to the newsletter list called Updates and Insights, and just stay up to date with everything ELC. And also, you can go to the Facebook Epic Life Tarot and request to be added to that as well. And if you want to join the Sabbath service online, then you can go to elc.online.church and interact with me and the rest of the online community there. And a part of the Sabbath service uh, is that we do the tour portion every week. And some guys from the church get up and they, they say what Yahweh has given to them concerning the Torah portion, some insight, some revelation. And so this week's Torah portion is called Vaera, and that means, and he appeared. And so a couple of things that I got out of it is that Abraham is standing before Yahweh, and he is pleading for Sodom. He is pleading for the righteous to be brought out of the city. He says, hey, will you destroy the wicked with the righteous, or the righteous with the wicked? And so he starts off at 50 people. If you find 50 righteous, will you destroy the city? So he goes all the way down to 10. And finally he leaves off. And it just strikes me that, that Abraham is interceding. He's pleading. He's not asking for destruction. He's asking for mercy. And so when we're at work and we're walking around shopping or just doing the things we do every day, are we pleading Yahweh for mercy for people? Are we interceding for our city? Are we interceding for our nation? Do we ask Yahweh to burn it down to the ground? Or do we ask Yahweh, hey, please have mercy. These people, they just don't know. Have mercy on the righteous within the city. And so that's something that that uh, it, it encouraged me is to, to offer up prayers and supplications more so for the salvation and the mercy and grace for those who don't know Yahweh. It could be your family, your friends, your coworkers. So we need to have an interceding heart. I need to have an interceding and merciful and gracious heart for those who don't know Yahweh. And another thing is the famous binding of Isaac, where Abraham is told to take his son, his only son, Isaac, and offer up as offer him up as a burnt offering to Yahweh. And so Isaac lays the wood on his back, and they go up to Mount Moriah for him to be offered there. And so Isaac says, Abraham, father, you know, we have the wood and we have the fire. Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Yahweh says, or so Abraham says, Yahweh will provide himself the lamb. And so this, this story is so symbolic and such a picture of, of Yeshua. As a matter of fact, on the, it's the same mountain that Yeshua is, is crucified on, Mount Moriah. And the New Testament is called the place of the skull. And the, the reason it's called that is because tradition has it that Adam died and was buried on this mountain. So you have the first Adam dying here, and you have the last Adam dying here. So amazing. And so lastly, uh, you know, send me, send me an email. What did you get out of this Torah portion? I would love to hear it. It would be so awesome. And lastly, if you would love to give to ELC, you know, we... We're so grateful for everyone who is who feels led to give. And so if you would if you feel led to give, then go to the website epiclifetarot.com and hit the give button or just follow the link in the description. And with that, thank you for joining us again. Have a blessed Sabbath and may your day just be filled with wisdom and love and knowledge of Yeshua.
we focused on last week, we've been focusing on his authority. Like if he is the Messiah, and if he's not only the Messiah, but he's Yahweh, God, in the flesh, then he obviously he would have all authority. And I want you to think about that for a moment before we really get, it, get, get into the details. He has all authority. That's kind of what we established it, that no matter what you are going through, no matter what's happening in your life, no matter what someone else may say, he has all authority. I think some of y'all got that. Some of y'all struggling, but you forgot. Yahweh has all authority. It's submitting ourselves to him. It's submitting to his deity. It's submitting to what he has done. And this really, today's message, is gonna, it's going to go right into... Uh, what we what we've already established here and in this message because of who he is his deity he holds all things in his hand i love what um what was spoken this morning during the torah portion right taylor brought a great example of that right what did he say like like yeshua has everything like, he is the persona of Yahweh. He's Yahweh. So when we see him, he's already stated this what? See the Father. You're not, there's, no, there's no denying that. And I love that because it really goes into uh, what we're talking about this morning. Knowing this, knowing who Yeshua is, and now understanding his authority. This is going to bring us into a pretty cool discussion, I think, this morning. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, we know that all things work together for your good, for your glory, Father. You are truly our holy God. Lord, I pray for this message. I pray for my words this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would speak, Lord, and Lord, that we would hear. I pray this morning that we would have ears to hear and eyes to see what the Spirit of Yahweh is saying to the body of Messiah. Lord, may you convict us, may you challenge us, may you change us by the power of your word. In the mighty name of Yeshua, we pray. So as a follower of Messiah, you're either pressing in toward the goal or you're drifting. There's really not a medium ground. There's really not a place where you're kind of, we get to stand in the center. There's not a neutral there's not a neutral ground in our walk as followers of Christ. You're either driving towards Messiah or you're being pulled away from Messiah. Yes. Because if you're stagnant and you're in the middle, guess what? You're pulling away. And the problem with that is if we don't do something, we will drift. If we don't give earnest attention to the direction of our lives. I like to say it like this, that we should always be giving ourselves that checkup from the neck up, right? We should always be evaluating where we're at in our, in our heart, in our life. Not what everybody gets to see, not what we put on display, but who we really are in the depths of our heart, in our thoughts, and also in our actions when no one's around. This is really where our text is going to take us today. And it makes us think about this great ship that's steaming foot by foot to the wharf to be tied up in safety, that we're going to be hinged somewhere. But if it's not, if it doesn't get tied up, what happens to a boat? You all know what happens to a boat if you don't tie it, tie it down well? It drifts out. And I feel like sometimes in the body of Messiah, that's what happens. If we don't tie up, we're drifting. And especially in kind of this movement that we're a part of, there's a lot of drifting that goes on. So as we dive into this, I want you to be thinking about that because we're going to jump into chapter two. And I believe we're going to make some pretty decent headway today um, in this chapter. I think we're going to get about four verses. That's quite a few. If you know, you know, right? But let's take a look at Hebrews chapter two, verse one, right off the bat, right? For this reason. What reason? Well, you got to go back to what we've been talking about. What's the reason? The reason is knowing and identifying who Messiah is. His deity. That he is above the angel. That he's above principality. That he's above everything in heaven and earth. That he holds, right? We learned that. That he holds the universe together. 
So when you understand, go back, like this is a, this is one of those tying phrases that ties us back again. It says, for this reason, it is necessary for us to, oh, I love this, watch, to pay especially close attention. Now, if you needed something to grab your attention this morning, man, I'm asking that this should be it, right? Like, you, because of this reason, in other words, who Jesus is, who the Messiah is, we need to pay close attention. Why? Attention to what? To what we've heard. Why? So that we do not drift away. We do not drift away. Isn't that interesting? Right here in the book of Hebrews, that we remember now, I'll probably say this several times, but remember who he's speaking to. He's speaking to Hebrews. And he's not just speaking to any Hebrew, he's speaking to Hebrews who have come under the understanding and to the knowledge of who Messiah is. And, well, I almost said Paul, but the author, whether it's Paul or Luke or whoever it may be, he is, he is he's trying to bring them back to a very critical Understanding And the understanding is because we know who Messiah is. Don't drift. Don't drift. These were Hebrews who had come to the faith of Messiah, and they were beginning to desire, they were beginning to want the old ways. We'll see this later on in the text or uh, further on in the book, where they wanted the temple, they wanted the sacrifices, they wanted to do those things again. And the author is he's, he's, he's begging them. Like, wait a minute, now that we know who Messiah is, now that we recognize his authority for this reason, don't drift. Don't drift back. Don't drift. This should get our attention because the application is really, it's just applicable to us today as it was for them in that day. It really is. For we see that there are some who've even come to the faith of Torah who understands, not that we're saved by Torah, by any means, we are saved by the grace through faith in Messiah Yeshua. But what happens is, we get into the shiny stuff and all the sparklies that happen within the movement, and what do we do? We begin to drift. That's why I said earlier that we, this is going to be like tying a ship and making sure, like, I, I've watched several, like, uh, Deadliest catch and stuff like that, right? And one of the things that the captain would get so angry about is the way they tie they tie that big ship up, right? Because if they don't do it right, it may look like it's tied, right? But still, the waves crashing against it and, and bumping it, and it begins to pull the ship loose. Isn't that like us sometimes, right? We, we think we're, we're, we're tied on. We think we're, we're, we're ready to, to weather the storm, whatever that storm is. But then the storm comes, and we begin to drift. The waves pick up. We begin to drift. And so I really want to focus in on that, to look at that. Because we see that people are doing the same thing. They, too, in the faith, are beginning to drift over to the things that have been done away with. Now, you know me. If you don't know me, let me tell you something. I believe in the Torah. I love the Torah. I study many, many hours a week on the Torah. But I also believe that the Torah doesn't save me. It can't. We know that because of the evidence that's presented to us through the book of Acts, Romans. Nobody was saved because they did good on the Torah. We need Messiah. We need Messiah. The phrase that I really want to bring us attention to is, if I can back this up a minute here, let me back this up, is, is that phrase, right? Pay special Attention. Where's that at? There it is. Too far. There it is. Pay especially close attention. Now, we've heard this type of statements before. Now, you may not know it. You may not realize it because we're in, we're in the uh, Brit Hadashah. We're in the New Testament. And so you may think, you may not correlate this, what, what he's saying, and I'm hoping by the end here you will. And this is powerful. This is not just about looking at something like giving all of our attention, having that laser-like focus. No, it's deeper than that. It's not about eyesight. It's not just about looking at something. The author's intention is for us to do something very specific in this, this phrase, pay, pay a special close attention. And literally, he's asking us to obey. I want to prove that to you here in a minute. On a lexicon level, the lexicon of the Hebrew and the Greek, 
this phrase here that we're looking at, I'm going to go ahead and move this over to the, let's move this over to the, uh, other people up here. This, this phrase means, it's the word prosikio in the Greek, and in context, as this that we're reading here in the book of Hebrews, it means merely, it means more than merely to observe or take notice, but it means to give heed. It means to listen with obedience. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Have we heard that word somewhere before? Now, I think what's interesting is this phrase is only found here in the book of Hebrews, which is a whole nother, like, cool thing, because who is he speaking to? He's speaking to Hebrews. Right? What does that mean? Maybe fall asleep going, I don't, I don't get it. Because the Hebrews would have understood that statement. That phrase, that phraseology that's being used. This literally is the Shema in the New Testament. We know the Shema to mean in the Hebrew to not just hear like I'm with my physical ears, but it's to hear with the intent to walk in obedience. So he, when he says, pay close attention lest we drift away, he say, look, watch out, obey, lest you drift. That's powerful. So then the question is then, what things, right, did they hear? What things did they need to pay special attention to? What were the things that we're listening to? My guess would be, because in context it doesn't tell us, but we can, we can ascertain from the discussion what the author is trying to convey to the people of Hebrew. We can, we can come up with an intelligent response to what probably... He's referring to, and that is this: Jesus is Messiah. I think about that. What is he trying to convince the Hebrews about in the very beginning in chapter one? We can go back to chapter one and look at it. Probably like cough, cough, cough. Right? What's he trying to convince them that he is the Son of God, not just a Son, right, but the Son, that he's the Messiah, that he holds all authority, right? So he's convincing them that, knowing this. That a Jew, right, is speaking to a Jew, and he's saying to the Jewish people, says, we know who the Messiah is, that is, in fact, that he is Yahweh, God, and that he has all authority, and that he is above the angels, and that he is our Messiah on this premise. Let's heed, let's pay attention to the things that we have heard. That's powerful. That should bring us back. That should like wrap that, uh, I don't know what they call the, 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 the knot that they tie on a boat, but that should really tie things down for us. Because if the Messiah is just another angel, we've already had this argument further on, there's little reason to take this gospel seriously. So if Jesus is just as high as the angels, and he just, he's comparative to an angel, then we don't need to be paying attention to this. We need to be looking looking for a Messiah. But because he is God's son, the son of God, and even much better than angels, versus, if we go back to chapter 1, verse 4, and then proved in chapter 1, verses 5 through 13, therefore, our job must pay attention more carefully to the things that we've heard. In other words, where are your, where's your placement of the Messiah? Where's your placement of Jesus in your life? Are you drifting? This word drift or to drift is crazy. It means, <coughs> y'all pardon me, I'm coming off what everybody else is coming into. So I get a, my throat gets a little scratchy, but watch this. This word this drift is to disbelieve. It's not just drifting on a river. It's not just like being on a, and you're floating around. This literally means to drift, to disbelieve gradually or slowly. You know that the enemy, like when he presents something to you to get you off track, it's not going to be a, you know, just a big, big thing. It happens slowly, doesn't it? You don't get off track just like one big thing. It happens a little here, a little there. 
a little bit more. We start, you know, hey, I got up late, so I'm not going to read my Bible tonight. Oh, man, I missed prayer again. Oh, that's no big deal. I'll make up for it. But little things. It's okay to watch this particular program on TV. It's not a big deal. You know, not a big deal there. And slowly, he just whittles you down until you wake up one day and you go, where in the world am I? It's like your marriage, isn't it? Like your marriage takes work. And it's the little things that begin to draw us away. We work a little longer than we should on the job. And we miss some time with our spouse or our children. Right? It's the little things. We don't appreciate our wife and say we love you and thank you for making dinner. We don't appreciate our husband and say, man, I appreciate the things that you do for our home. It's the little things. And then before you know it, three, four years in a row or five years of that happening, you wake up and you find yourself not in love with your spouse anymore. And you think it's their fault. When gradually and slowly the enemy has come in and just little things that you start whittling away on your love for your spouse. It's the same thing in our life with Messiah. It's the little things that begin to draw us away. It's to be conceived as being carried along due to a water current. What's interesting about this word is that it's not used in any other place in the New Testament, this drifting away. And it's only here. Why? Because I believe the author is warning the people, the Hebrew people, he's warning them. He's saying, hey, you better wake up. Because you're drifting. That's the whole book of Hebrew, is that you're drifting. And this is where we are today. There are so many false beliefs that have come into our lives and will cause us to drift from what matters. And what matters, you know, have y'all heard that? The, keep the main thing the main thing, right? Have y'all heard that? The only main thing that's the main thing is Messiah. That's the main thing. And when we lose sight of that, we will begin to drift. Because then you're allowing anything and everything to come in and feed that dichotomy when you're not supposed to. It has to focus on the side. This is why we talk about a lot in our community because it's essential that we understand that, man, go and study Torah. Man, do it. Go and get into the weeds a little bit. It's fun. I did it. The weeds are fun. You like to get in those weeds and, and all this, is the temple going to be built and the red heifer? Oh, my goodness. Like, let's find out about that. Really fun, right? But let me tell you something. As you walk into those weeds, you begin to lose sight of what matters. And what matters is Messiah. Everything needs to be compared. Everything gets lined up to our belief in Messiah. And if you miss that, you're going to get off in the weeds, and you're going to look up, and you're going to look around, and you're not going to know where you're at because you're going to be lost. You're going to be lost. The writer is seeing this in the book of Hebrews, and he's warning them. You're drifting. You're trying to go back to the things that, that the Lord has pulled you away from. Highway travelers dislike, especially in Texas, right? Uh, if you're online, we're in Texas. And, and uh, one of the things that is of great supply in the state of Texas is road construction. <laughs> right? I mean, probably if you were on your way here, you probably passed two or three of them. Right? And what I hate about road construction, because I used to work for the highway department, so don't yell at me, it's not my fault. All right? I did, man. I would, I, we were part of, a, I worked for the bridge crew in Dallas, and usually we get called out, we did a lot of emergency repairs, and so, and usually all the repairs, all the damage would happen like at 4.30 in the afternoon on a Friday, right? And so we have to shut a bridge down, right? We got people throwing Dr. Pepper cans at us, and hitting our cones and yelling and screaming like us because that's what we wanted to do on our Friday afternoon was to shut the bridge down on Highway 30 going through Dallas, right? Praise the Lord that they are redoing all of that. But it's interesting because road signs are interesting. They're, they're there for one specific reason, and it's really to protect the, the driving public. They're there to protect you and to protect those that are doing the work, whatever that, that work may be. But it's funny because here in Texas, we see it so often that we ignore it, that they're breaking laws. We don't pay attention to them anymore. That same, that same thing happens as us as followers of Christ. We see the things happening all the time. 
We see the problem all the time. We hear Pastor Mike or one of the elders come up here and speak and say, don't do this, don't do this. We hear it all the time, but we don't take heed. Or we don't receive the warning. Or we don't watch the warning sign. And then we end up driving off in an area that we were never meant to be. And this is your warning sign. This is the flashing lights. This is the slow road work ahead. Don't go this way. Because if you do, you're going to get off in the weeds and you're going to get lost. Don't drift. Christ announced his salvation. That is what we focus on. Salvation. If we're not heeding the warning, we'll not escape. Christ announced his salvation. His followers confirmed it and God testifies to it. That's what we're going to see here in a moment. Like you can't make this stuff up. It's so good. We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away knowing who the writer is speaking to. And think about it like this, right? I mean, if the people, if, if, if this author who's writing to the Hebrew people, he sees what's going on, and he's warning them, the Jewish people, the protectors of the Torah, the guardians, and he's warning them. Like, think about that. What makes us think? That we're not any better as Gentiles coming in. Discovering this truth. If the, if the letter is addressed to a messianic community, then it would be a good guess, in my opinion, to assume that he's speaking about who the Messiah is. He's trying to point them back to who the Messiah is, what the Messiah did on the cross, his resurrection, and his return. These are the things we should be really leaning into you ask anybody in this community I would assume and I say that because I think I know our, our community pretty well is that we know and we believe that the Messiah his return is so close yet that should be a warning for all of us shouldn't it what was that old uh, the, the little robot Will Rogers Danger Will Rogers Danger Danger what was that that, that lost in space y'all how many of y'all remember lost in space some of you kids are going what it's a great movie actually it was a regular weekly television show right Will Rogers uh, Will Rogers was a kid I think and he had his friend the little robot right uh, I don't really know if he can watch it anymore but he when the robot knew when danger was approaching and so you know and he would he would wave his little uh, I think they were briar hands they look like dryer uh, vents, right? And he'd wave them around. Will Rogers, danger Will Rogers. I'd probably look like an idiot right now online, but praise God. But I'd rather look like an idiot telling to my community, danger, danger, danger. Danger. Don't go into the weeds. Don't drift. That's what the author's telling the writer or the The author's purpose of writing to them is not primarily to draw a true theology, I think, a kind of a, kind of a, a red line that we can follow, or even proper doctrine, although those are included. Instead, the purpose was to encourage Jewish Christians not to turn away from the faith, not to lose faith, not to lose hope. If these Christians were not careful, pressure from non-believing Jews or other influences could lead them away from Christ. And then how, 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 how much more does that matter today? You know, every person in this room, you're here because you want to be a part of a community. I, I know you're not here because I'm such a great, elaborate speaker like that. I know that's not true, right? Or because Jordan's good-looking, tall, right? We know. We always have to have a GQ guy. Who's our GQ guy, right? <laughs> He's got the voice, like the radio voice. But you're not here for that. You're here because you want to belong. You're here because you want to belong. You're here because you want to belong to a community of like-minded believers. That's why you're here. Why is that important? Because sometimes to belong, we'll sacrifice things that we shouldn't be sacrificing. Because we don't want to be, we don't want to be that person, right? We don't want to be that person that disagrees with everybody. We don't want to be that person that's, that's trying to stay on the narrow road. Like everybody else is exploring all of this stuff that we don't find in the Bible. We don't want to be that person. But yet, the author of Hebrews is saying be that person. 
to guard yourself. Because if you don't guard yourself, you will drift. See, he's telling, he's warning them, you know, that, that uh, the influences that can come and drift us away from God. Because, number one, we see this already because Christ surpasses angels and other messengers of the Old Testament. We already talked about that a couple weeks ago. And the writer's challenging the Hebrew Christians to remember Christ's teaching and Christ's message. What we've all heard. This message that most of you in this room know. You know the message of Messiah. Don't walk away from that. We're challenged even in the book of Proverbs. When we look at Proverbs uh, 3.21, right? What does it say? It says, my son, hold on to sound wisdom and dis discernment, right? Hold on to sound wisdom. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. If it's not lining up to Scripture, how do we determine what sound discernment is or wisdom? For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Do not, this is so good, what? Do not let them out of your sight. Right? Hold on to truth. Hold on to wisdom. Don't let it go. Let, don't let them out of your sight. You know, it's easy to, in this, in this movement, it's easy to get there. We don't want you to get lost. See, just because something sounds good doesn't mean that it is. You and I must hold on to what we know as sound wisdom and discernment. Not just any type of wisdom. Wisdom that aligns itself with the word of Yahweh. If it can't find it in scripture, if it's not written in the word, sure, study it, man, it's exciting, I get it. But don't let that be your compass. Don't let that be what influences you. I know some of y'all in here, you like to get into the deep stuff. Man, that's great. But don't let that deep stuff determine who you are in Messiah. You'll get lost. Sound wisdom, a particular kind of wisdom, perhaps with an emphasis on the soundness or the efficiency. So in other words, we're coming from Scripture. Uh, I, interesting because when I was thinking of this passage and, and kind of what the message that's being conveyed here, it really challenged me and it reminded me of, uh, of Acts. And in the book of Acts, there's a warning also in the book of Acts, and I love it because most of you probably have read this or, or know it. And he says, I know that after my departure, we believe this could be Luke. A lot of people believe that uh, the book of Luke was written, uh, the book of Luke, uh, Acts was written by the hand of Luke. He says, I know that after my departure, or Paul, uh, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among them, not sparing the flock. Even from among yourselves will arise men speaking perversions. Now, what's interesting is this word perversions isn't a word like we're used to in, in common English, like a pervert, right? We, we can kind of picture whatever that may be. This literally means disbelief. This literally means to come in and pull you away from the belief in Messiah and get you to believe something else and change your course of direction. That's powerful. It's powerful. It means to mislead you. To deceive. Even from among yourselves will arise men speaking perversions to draw the disciples away after themselves. Wow. Now this is going to make sense here in a minute. I think there's a, another, just another piece of, of this puzzle that we're discovering as we read this. Because I love this, this, this understanding of this, this perversion because it literally will open your, your, your understanding here. It means to cause someone to wander from a proper belief or course of action. He's saying that, man, if I leave, men are going to come in like savage wolves. What do wolves do? They tear up, they devour, they attack. And what's their purpose? Their whole purpose is to cause someone to wander from the truth, their belief, or course of action. That should get our attention. This was his concern in the book of Acts. 
I want us to see right here to draw the disciples away after who? Themselves. Themselves. You know, I said this before, I'm going to say it again. That if you want to understand what truth is or what we should believe or what we shouldn't believe, it's super, it's super simple. Really, it is, man. And it is this. And I'm going to do it in the most simplest terms. Not saying you're simple-minded at all. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that it, it's, it's the attack, the weapon that we have to use is simple. It's twofold. Number one. Number one is does it lead me to Jesus? Does what I'm teaching or hearing, is it making me closer to the Messiah? Number two, does it draw others to the kingdom? Does it draw others to Christ and what he did on the cross? This is not an excuse to break Torah. That's not what we're saying, because the Torah, if we're living it out correctly, will draw us to Messiah. There's a war on, church. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. There is a war. And the war isn't with weapons right now. The war isn't with physical things. It's not name-calling. It's going to be done in love. It's going to be very passive. But it is a war on truth. What is true and what is not true? Well, that's just your belief, Pastor Mike. You get to believe that. I'm going to believe that. No, it is a war on truth. And we all in this room, all in line, we need to wake up to this war and this battle that's happening around us. This apostopeo is this word we look at when we see drifting away or truth. It's, it's, it's about drawing out, about dragging us, it's about luring, luring us away. Drifting. Being lured. Like, you don't lure, like, coming out at you. Like, the enemy's not going to come out and go, hey, let me teach you some false doctrine. This is the false doctrine. Hey, I'm the devil. Look at this. No, man, it'll be done with a brother or sister who comes in, maybe into your life. They smile. They look pretty. They smell good. They shower. They brush their teeth. And they come in, and they befriend you, and they, oh, man, I can't imagine what you're going through right now. Oh, you know, and what happens is we, we're slowly, methodically being drawn away from the truth. It also means, this word, it means to be attracted to other beliefs. Drifting away. To be lured away, pulled out, drawn away, attracted to other beliefs. This is the whole reason. Isn't this the, though, now isn't this the reason why we have the Moedim? Isn't this the reason why we're supposed to wear tzitzis? Isn't this the reason why we protect the Shabbat? All of this is what? To remind us. To remind us not to drift away. To remind us not to fall for the stuff, this other, to drift, to go off. It's the whole reason why we have these, not to drift away. We're not to drift. I mean, wasn't this the commandment given to the nation of Israel in the book of Deuteronomy? Like when they finally come to possess the promised land, what was the reminder? Now when Yahweh your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, to give you great and good cities that you did not build, houses full of good things that you did not fill, cisterns dug that you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. This is wonderful stuff, by the way. And there's a whole other message in there of Yahweh's provision to you. Yahweh's provision to you, not someone else. That you did not plant, all of trees that you did not plant, and you eat and are full. What's the warning? Verse 12. Right? Then watch yourself. It's exactly what the book of Hebrews is telling. It's a Jewish man writing to Jewish people, and he's reminding the same thing that Yahweh reminded the entire nation of Israel. And what is that? Do not forget. This wasn't like a slip up, like, don't forget. Literally, this phrase, do not forget, means walk in disobedience. Powerful. 
Do not forget Yahweh who brought you out from the land of Egypt from the house of slavery. And to the believer today, I would say, do not forget. You've been delivered from your addiction. Your marriage has been healed, right? You've got salvation now. You were lost. You were going. Your, 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 your life was separated from Yahweh. And Jesus, through grace and his love and his compassion, draws you in by the Ruach HaKadosh. And to you, I say, don't forget. Don't forget. Don't forget how you got here. This is exactly what's happening in the book of Hebrews. The author is trying to persuade the Hebrew people and the followers of Messiah, don't forget. Don't forget where you came from. And I believe, I believe we are experiencing one of the greatest spiritual battles and spiritual warfare than most even realize. I mean, think about this, man. We live in a world right now filled with distractions. It's nothing but distractions. I mean, you ever think about that? I mean, everywhere you look, it's distractions, distractions, distractions. Something is always buying for your time. Have you ever noticed that we don't have enough time to finish things? It seems like, my goodness, every time I turn around, I'm like, oh, my gosh, i, I got to get to that. i got to get this done. i got to get that done. We never have enough time. Why? Because you're in a spiritual battle that you don't realize. According to a recent report, the average daily time spent on YouTube in the United States has been increasing over the past few years. In 2019, the number clocked in at 39.7 minutes a day. Now, you break that up within the day. That's a lot of distraction, right? And I, I would submit to you that that's way higher today. This rose to 43.7 minutes in the year 2020, a over 10% increase, rise, and the largest annual increase expected between 2019 and 2024 is even much higher. Now, I don't want you to raise your hand, but how many times have you looked on, the, what do they call the reels or shorts, and you're just scrolling, going through there, going through there, going through there, and you look up, and an hour's passed by, or 30 minutes has passed by, or whatever it is your distraction may be. There's a war out over your mind. There's a war for your time. And you're limited. That's the crazy thing, right? All of us have the same amount of time. Every one of us. No one is more special than another. We all have 24 hours every day. If you woke up this morning, you have 24 hours. The question is, what are you doing with that time? Like, isn't it interesting that we can spend an hour or two hours watching a television program or a movie but we can't spend an hour reading the Bible. Or think about it like this. You have all this energy, right? And you lay, you sit down like you're going to spend some quality time in prayer with the Lord. And what happens? <laughs> Fall asleep. Why? Spiritual battle. There's a war for you. I just find it interesting. It's interesting, fascinating. I want to take you to Galatians real quick because there's a statement in Galatians, and it's exactly another plea to the Galatian church from Paul. And what's he say? Most of y'all know this, right? Oh, foolish Galatians. Watch what he says. Who cast a spell on you? You can really paraphrase this by going, Oh, foolish Galatians, who's distracted you? Who fooled you? Who's distracting you, man? What's going on? Right? Before your eyes, Yeshua the Messiah was clearly portrayed as crucified. And I want to find out just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by deeds based on Torah or by hearing based on trust? Are you so foolish at the beginning with the Spirit when you now reach your goal in the flesh? Right? What is he saying? Remember the argument here. This isn't to say we should do away with Torah. What's the argument? The argument was salvation by circumcision. Right? These guys had known the truth. And then those who had come in from the way that the, the Pharisees who had come over to Christ were now coming back behind Paul and Barnabas. And what were they doing? They were saying, well, you're not really in yet. You're not in until you're circumcised. 
And what's crazy about it is that even in the Gentile church today, we have men and women who believe that you need to be circumcised in order to be fully saved, and that's absolutely false. I didn't have time to study the test or the study, do the studying of it, but I'll just remind you of what Paul said. He said, if you came in circumcised or uncircumcised, neither one of them avail much or avail anything. But we're all coming in by faith. It's not by your circumcision. I know that just wiped out some of y'all's theology or offended you, and I'm sorry. But the truth of the matter is, it's not by works. It doesn't eliminate us obedience to the Torah. But salvation, circumcision was about covenant. We now have a covenant because of Yeshua. We're in covenant because of what Yeshua did. Don't forget, again, you get off in the weeds. It sounds good. It sounds cool. Right? Well, unfortunately, here Paul is reminding the Galatians of the truth that he had proclaimed to them, which was the Gentiles should be justified before God through faith. But they were in it because of what Yeshua did for them. And they had stepped out in that. But man, they were deceived. They began to drift. Just like we do today. This is powerful. So in the Hebrew and in the Greek, this is so good, but I kind of come back to something I've already stated. The word to listen, both in the Hebrew and Greek, has a sense of paying close attention to, meaning to act upon what has been taught. Right? That is what? The Shema. We know the difference between merely hearing someone and listening with the intent to know and understand what's being said. It's clear that we can hear without listening. Just ask your wife. I do it. I make mistakes, right? So I'll read this chapter and chapter. Did you hear me? Yes, dear. What did I say? I don't know. Not the word of all bear. This word, pay close attention, this drifting that we say, this prosecchio, is often used in the lexicon of the Torah to translate the word shema. To guard, especially in the sense of guarding yourself. I love that because who, it's, it's your responsibility. Right? No one can guard your heart. No one can guard your mind better than you. See, that means that the responsibility is on you. You have to put things away. You have to turn your phone off. You have to end the distractions. You have to tell people, I don't have time right now. I need to spend time with the Lord. Making that a priority. It's interesting, right? Because in the same statement is that we, like, I, I believe all of you this, right? I, I don't think anybody, we may, if you live way out in the country, you know, you may not lock your doors. You may have a gate on your community or on your home, and you don't lock your gate. I don't know too many people who do that. We put locks on our door to lock our door, to protect what's inside, to guard our home, right? I've got three gates, and all three of the gates, when we're not there, are locked. And I don't want people coming into my yard while I'm not there. I got a dog that likes to bark. He's friendly, but he barks loud, right? Why do we have him? We got him because we don't want people sneaking up in our yard. We put guards over our stuff. Why are we guarding our heart? Why are we locking things away in our life and not letting just anything come through? We need to pay attention to that. The Bible tells us, not the Bible, the, 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 the rabbis understood this concept of protection. And uh, in the Mishnah, in Avot 1-1, this is really, I, I just find it interesting, I wanted to share it with you, what the Mishnah says, Right? It says, Moses received, this is uh, the, the Torah that they're referring to is the oral Torah. It's not the Ten Commandments that we know, but the, the, what they feel like is the, the, the oral Torah. So Moses received Torah from Sinai and passed it on to Joshua and Joshua to the elders and the elders of the prophets. And even for hundreds of years, that's how they would, that's how the Torah was passed down, was orally. Like now, obviously, we have it written down in, in different computerized formats or written formats now. But, and the elders to the prophets, and the prophets passed it on to the men of the great assembly. And watch this. They had three sayings. Be deliberate in judging. I think we need to be better at that. And I'm not talking about judging one another, but be, be more deliberate in what we allow, what we judge in our life. We should be better deliberately. We should be deliberate at that. None of this is bad. Like, none of this is bad stuff. But it can be 
you can turn it into legalism. I understand that. Educate many students. What does that mean? Make disciples. There's nothing wrong with making disciples, man. We need to be doing that a lot more, don't we? But here's, here's what I want to get to. Make a fence around the throne. That's kind of how they got in this conundrum, isn't it? With, with Yeshua in the New Testament where we see the Pharisees. And they, they actually made the fence around Torah, which is, uh, if you didn't know this, and let me kind of give you just a little bit of background, like for the Shabbat, or uh, actually we just finished Sukkot, so I thought it was funny when I was, I was talking to a few people about Sukkot. Because in, in the Mishnah, there's a fence around Sukkot. And the fence is like 32 other laws, right? So like we're commanded to keep Sukkot, to, right? And, and that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to keep and honor the, 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 the feast day, and there's a couple of requirements for that. But in the Mishnah, if there's 32 of them, like, like, like silly ones, like, like if you build your Sukkot on top of another Sukkot, which I don't know why you would do that and someone wouldn't get mad about it, but they would. Then the top Sukkot is valid and the one that's on the bottom is invalid, right? So you have your neighbor, right? You love, really you love your neighbor and they built their Sukkot and you're like, man, there's no room. I can build mine on top of theirs. You just made your Sukkot invalid. Like, great, good job. That was the Torah. That was this fence that they built around. They called it a They said that in Sukkot, I don't think anybody did this. During Sukkot, if you don't have your first meal in the sukkah, right? How many of y'all had your first meal in a Sukkot? Okay. Your whole Sukkot was invalid. That's what the Mishnah said. So what they did was they built this fence around the Torah to try to protect the Torah so people wouldn't sin. Now, the intention was good, but the results were horrible. My point in bringing that out is that we should be building a fence around our heart, around our mind, the things that we allow in, the things that we teach, the things that we understand. We need to be doing that in our own life, not to make le le to be legalistic, but so that we do what the Bible tells us to do, right? So what is that? To guard our heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. It's your responsibility. See, if you have a lust problem, build a fence, man. Build a fence. Well, what do you mean? Uh, I don't know. Get a accountable, we use accountable to you. That's one of them. Uh, I think there's another one called Angel Eyes or something. What's it called? Uh, what is it? Covenant Eyes. Thank you. There's a couple of them out there. And then make your wife your, your, uh, your accountability partner. Yeah, if you have a problem with that, watch how well that works. Right? Let her have freedom of your phone, your passwords. Put a guard over it. Guard your heart. Don't put yourself in a situation if you have a drinking problem that makes you drink. Well, I'm going to go to the bar tonight, but I'm going to just witness to them. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to share Jesus with them. Are you an idiot? Just going to sit up there. Put a guard up. If you can't sit down and watch one 30-minute show on television, get rid of your television. Put a guard up. Whatever it may be in your life, put a guard around your heart so that you don't sin against Yahweh, so that you don't drift. It's easy to drift. It's easy to drift when you're alone. I know you guys are real quiet right now. The warning found in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, to not drift. How do we prevent drifting? We have to build our own fences. We have to guard our hearts. We have to guard our minds. I remember as a kid, as a child, when I was given my first pocket knife. I don't even remember what kind of knife it was. I just remember it. And I remember my brothers and I would try to sharpen our knives just to sharpen them. And we had the old stones, right, where you could... Like you sit there for hours and you can't, you don't ever had read that. The stone, the wet stones, what they called it, or an oil stone. And you sit there and you just rub it and circle it to a laser blade, right? You can't shave with it, right? Took some bucks on it. I was like eight years old, so um, I haven't had that beard that long. So. But what's cool about this is that when I got that pocket knife, I found a, a, a piece of, a, of wood down by the creek. I, my, we lived in a, a trailer park in, in, uh, when I was young uh, with my father in, uh, in Northern California. And uh, right next to this was a huge creek. It was a creek that pretty much, uh, pretty regularly was li literally overflowing. It was pretty fast rapids. And so I would go down there and just hang out. You know, it wasn't too far from the house. And so my dad could yell and I could hear him and I could run back to the house. And I remember getting this knife and I would sit there and I found a piece of, uh, what's it called, balsa wood or whatever. The, 
of soft wood, and, and I sit there and I just carve. And I ended up carving like my first ever stick to, uh, to, uh, canoe. Like it wasn't like, it didn't look like a canoe, but it looked like a canoe to me. You know, what it usually did to me, eight or nine years old. And this water was going, and so I set that thing down in the water. And I'm thinking, man, I'm going to let that thing go. I'm going to run down here, and I'm going to grab it, right? Oh, no. I let it go, and there it went. The rapids took it. And I could never, ever get it back. And I spent a lot of time on this little thing, right? I spent, actually, I spent a lot of time. It's probably like two days. To me, it felt like six months, right? But I've spent several days on it, carving, carving it out, making sure the shape was perfect. I got the sandpaper out, stole it from my dad's shop, and started sanding it all down. He got it nice and smooth. You know, it's almost like like they do the, what are the little, uh, the hot rods now they make, and they do the little derby races or whatever they're called. And I was proud of it. And when I took it down to the creek, and set it loose, I only had one little area that I could really like get a hold of that thing again, and I, I didn't estimate, I didn't, I didn't perceive how fast as an eight-year-old, nine-year-old kid you can't like get a hold of the thing. Right? And so that thing just took off. All my hard work, my sanding, my pride, everything. Down the river it went. Never to be seen, at least by me. Ever again. Everything was wasted. I lost everything. See, when we allow ourselves to drift, it's the same thing. You'll end up somewhere that you never intended to be. This is what the author is trying to convey. Do not drift. Now, we don't worship the fence that I'm telling you to build. But just remember merely that it's viewed as a safeguard to the things that we have learned, to the things Yahweh has showed us, to reveal to us more and more about Messiah. This is, this is what this whole verse, chapter 1, is about. Jumping into verse 2. Chapter 2, sorry. So he tells us don't drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proves to be firm, and every violation and disobedience received a just payback. Now we're kind of bringing in the Torah again. Remember that the message of the angels was the Torah. How shall we escape then if we neglect such a great salvation? That's scary. He's saying that, that the, the angels came with the message and that the message of the angels was Torah the coming of Messiah, and then if we violate that and disobedience, he says that there's a just payback for it. Then he says, how shall we escape? We being those of faith. Neglect such a great salvation. It was first spoken, it was first spoken through the Lord and confirmed to us by those who hear. What? The message of Christ. The message of the cross. What will happen if we neglect our salvation? What will happen? How do we neglect our salvation? Have you ever given that some thought? How do I neglect my salvation? If all there is to do, <coughs> pardon me, if all there is to do is to say this magic prayer, and then grace covers everything, how in the world then do I neglect my salvation? What could the author mean by us neglecting the salvation? Now, again, this is one of those things that I, I think I want to I challenge you, man, to learn to dive in to the original text. Because you'll, you, you discover something. And, and here's what it is. The term neglect means to not feel any concern. Think about that. Or have interest in it. Right? It simply means that you no longer care for it. Like you forget thinking about what Jesus did in your life. You forget thinking about the, the sacrifice that was made to bring you in. You forget what it meant. You forget, we forget what it was like before Christ. We forgot. And we've neglected the salvation. We've neglected what the cross did and what the cross meant. And don't miss this, church. We see this word used in connection 
one other time in the Bible, which I think is absolutely fascinating because I think it runs so well parallel to what the book of Hebrews is saying about neglecting our salvation. And it's found in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Watch this. We were talking about this this morning. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was given to you through prophecy with the laying on of hands of the elders. How many times as followers do we forget the gift that you've been given and we neglect it? In other words, we don't have no concern about it. We don't use it. We don't walk in it. I think the scripture says that many are called, but few are chosen. Why are few chosen? Because they neglect the gift that was given to them through the Holy Spirit. And every person in the sound of my voice today, whether here or online, you've been gifted. And just like we can get lost and we kind of get passive in our salvation, we can also get passive in the anointing and the call of the Holy Spirit that's on our life, the gift. Some of you are called to teach and you won't teach. Some of you are called to serve and you don't serve. Some of you are gifted in giving and you won't give. Not a concern to you. But yet the Bible says in 1 Timothy, this challenge from Paul to Timothy, his disciples, is don't neglect it. Don't neglect it. I'm astounded on how many followers of Messiah neglect the Holy Spirit and the fruit that comes from him. Better yet, those who are neglecting the spiritual gifts given to them. Do you realize that the spiritual gifts, just like, I just want to go like, just scratch the surface with it. Like love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, long suffering, self control, kindness, and goodness. Where are those? Those are fruits of the Holy Spirit. And every one of you possess them. And my favorite one is the top one. By this, all men will know that you are a disciple. That we walk in love. You can't walk in love and gossip at the same time. You can't walk in love and chastise at the same time people that you disagree with. Every time we do that, we're neglecting the spiritual gift that we have. From the Holy Spirit. You follow me? This is like, wow, Mike, you're being a little weighty. It's a weighty passage. It's weighty in scripture. And as a pastor, I would be, I would, I would be a derelict of duty if I didn't come to you and say, man, I love Torah, but don't neglect the Holy Spirit. We talked about this during Sukkot, man. I said, you know, if all you do is Torah and you leave out the Holy Spirit, let me tell you something, man. You are, you're like, medi you're like a jar, of, uh, a bottle of medication with no medication in it. You are. You have a prescription bottle, a painkiller, right? And there's nothing inside the bottle because you need the Holy Spirit to do the work. That's what was told to us, wasn't it? In the prophecy, it says that I'll put my spirit in them, and I will cause them to walk in Torah. I'll write it. Right? I'll write it on the, on the doorpost of your heart. So see, you don't have to make something happen. It naturally flows through the Holy Spirit. If you have a hard time obeying <coughs> God, you need to check yourself where you link yourself. You need to check the Holy Spirit. Where's he at? Have you quenched him? How do we quench the Holy Spirit? It's not even in the notes. How do we quench them? Sin. Sin. Lawlessness. Lawlessness will quench the Holy Spirit from moving in your life. It'll break the anointing. The book of Isaiah says it is the anointing that breaks yokes. You want to break yoke? How do we break yoke? We don't do it by our own works. We do it through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And the anointing is a representation of the Holy Spirit. Don't miss that. I'm going to get off my soap, soapbox. This is just... Man, you can't make this stuff up, man. This is this is the truth of Torah. Like this is what it means to walk in righteousness and walk in holiness. It isn't that we're trying to be something; it's that we are something, and we should not neglect it because of what because of anything. What Messiah did in you made you righteous. And here's a secret: like, watch this. You are not going to be any more righteous right now, right this minute, than you ever will be in your life. Because righteousness isn't based upon you; it's based upon Jesus. But comes a big but. We all have one. But you can walk away from it. You can walk in disobedience. You can choose to stay in the weeds. You can choose to stay in sin. 
You can choose it. And the Lord in his grace and his mercy will let you. Not because he doesn't love you, but because he does love you. He doesn't want robots. He wants you to freely choose him and his way of living, not our own. I have no idea where I'm at, praise the Lord. That's not even, that is not. So in Timothy, Paul is telling Timothy not to lose interest in what the Holy Spirit has done in him and what the Holy Spirit has given to him. There's an old phrase, right? Use it or lose it. When we begin to neglect the things of Yahweh, we will lose them. If you're not feeding the Spirit, if you're not feeding your Spirit, if you're not walking in the Word, if you're not praying and spending time, you're too distracted. May I warn you today, you are on the precept of drifting. Remember the salvation of Messiah. And if you don't, you'll come to a place where you'll forget no longer show any concern. That's literally what these words mean. And the Greek word neglect is the word amelio, and it means to lose interest in something. May we never lose interest in what Jesus did to us. Sometimes maybe you just need to go to a quiet room, right? Shut all the sound off and just remember who you were before Jesus, before Messiah. Or maybe you need to remember where you were or who you were before, before he revealed his Torah to you, his instruction on how to live. Don't miss this. We can sit around for hours upon hours with each other in fellowship. And I love fellowship. Next week. I mean, I am a people person, okay? I love hanging out with folks. That's maybe why Yahweh had me become a pastor. Just love it. I love listening to your stories. But if all I want to do is hang out with the community, but I don't spend time in prayer and fellowship with Yahweh, that's idolism. That's, an, that's idolatry. He didn't have, he doesn't want you to, listen, some of you, I need to say this, okay. So some of you, listen, you have children that you prayed for and you worship them. You're not called to worship your children. Worship, the, worship Yahweh who gave them to you. Don't miss that. We worship our community sometimes. And sometimes in the Torah movement, we've seen it over and over again, where we, we, we want community. We desire. I mean, there's, because it's, it's a human understanding. We want to belong. But don't let that become an idol in your life. If you commune... <laughs> If, you, if, you're, if you're desiring community more than you desire community with the Lord, there's something wrong. Remember, it's a war. It's a war for your mind. It's a war for your heart. It's a war for your time. And you're limited. Let's remember what Jesus said. We were talking about finances in this particular verse, but I love it because I think it applies. I think it's applicable to what we're talking about today. Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In other words, where your treasure is, that's where you're going to invest all your time. That's where you're going to do it. That's where all your time and energy is going to be where your heart. If you want to look, I tell people this all the time, and it's just a, it's just a little way that you can look, but there's other ways. Is that if you want to know what, what, what you meet, what, what's important to you, look at your calendar, look at your checkbook. That's it. It's easy. Where do you spend all your time and where do you spend all your money? Because for us as humans, that's pretty much a really good guarantee of what matters to us, what's important. Do you write down, you know, the first hours of your day belong to Yahweh? You should. Make a schedule. Schedule an appointment. Some of you need to schedule an appointment with him. You haven't, you haven't met with Daddy in a long time. And he's calling to you. Lest you neglect the truth of his word. In other words, wherever your, char your, your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. Notice, again, going back to Galatians again, going back to Galatians chapter 5, 17, look at Paul. Paul says it again. He says, for the flesh sets its desires. Watch. For the flesh sets its desires against the spirit. 
Is it going to be a war? You bet it is. Like, but I want to sleep in. I don't want to get up early and spend time in prayer. It's going to be a battle. Yeah, but you don't understand. I work late at night and I, it's going to be a battle. Yeah, but I got to have my coffee and my me time. It's going to be a battle. For the flesh sets its desires against the spirit, but the spirit, love this, sets its desires against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another so that you cannot do what you want. It's going to be a battle. Do not think it's going to be easy. If you're going to not neglect, it means you've got to reprioritize the things in your life. You've got to make the main thing the main thing again. Most of us know the story, and I'm not going to go into it. I didn't put it in the scriptures, but I just want to say something. Most of us here know the story of the bridegroom. It's the Hebrew idiom that we find in the book of Matthew. Ten bridesmaids were invited to the wedding feast to be prepared. We had only five. Five did not neglect. Five made sure they had oil in their lamp. The five others didn't. They neglected what was important. And some people go, well, what's the oil? Man, I mean, the oil can represent a lot of things. I think, I think fellowship with believers, I think fellowship with Yahweh is part of that oil. We know that the oil also is a representation of the Holy Spirit. Five, for whatever reason, they had no oil and had opportunity. If they had opportunity to get the oil, they were waiting there. They could have left at any time. They could have came prepared. But we don't see it, do we? And what's the scariest part about that verse, and I always go back to this verse because it is scary to me, is the very fact, man, that they were all invited to the feast. They all were bridesmaids. Was it always a bridesmaid, never a bride? They were all bridesmaids. And they all had the potential to become the bride. But yet they were distracted and they didn't take care of and make sure to make the important things matter and make sure that they had oil in their lamp. May this be a warning to the church as a whole today. Do not think for a moment because you said some magic prayer when you were five years old that you have oil in your lamp. I'd submit to you that you may be running dry and you're neglecting the salvation of your faith. Going back to our passage, I want us to look at one other thing here that I think is very important. And it's right here in the middle of it. It says, how shall we escape? For if the word spoken through angels proves to be firm and every violation of disobedience is received a just payback, listen to me, how shall we escape? This should compel us to do a heart check. To a life check. How shall we escape? If we neglect such a great salvation, the word of God. Knowing with what we know, we are without excuse. Knowing what Messiah has done, he who is, who was, and it is to come. Knowing that judgment is coming, we have no excuse. We should always be investing more into the kingdom of Yahweh than in this world i.e. this life. When we're not, what we're doing is neglecting our salvation. And just like the book of Hebrews here, in our letter, the message was confirmed in them, and we too have the same responsibility that our lives confirm what Messiah has done in us. It confirms the salvation. It confirms the message of the cross. So your lifestyle does matter. Because it's confirming what God has done in you. Question for you, and you alone, does your life reflect the message that you have heard? Looking over to the book of Mark. Mark 16. And they went out and proclaimed everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word. How? By signs that follow. Now, I have got few minutes, and I want, I'm going to finish this because I want to get to this point. Jordan and I were having this conversation this morning. I thought it was just so prevalent for today. Notice, man, that, that their life, right, what does it do? It reflects Messiah. How? 
We confirm the word by signs that follow. Question? Are signs following it? See, everywhere they went, the disciples, they proclaimed the Lord. They proclaimed the work of the Lord. And it was confirmed by signs and wonders. Yes, but those things are over with. I'm sorry to say they are not. I know evidence. I have evidence in this room. We had Sukkot, and during Sukkot, during the worship, I felt like the Lord had challenged me to call out some people that may have been sick. And typically when I do that, there's one or two people that the Lord's speaking to and, and wants us to pray over. I don't know how many people we had, 12? Like 12, something like that. And we had all these people come up. And just like in the Bible, you can't make this stuff up. There's, just like in the Bible, we had 12 people, but only two came back. And they both had a testimony that Yahweh healed. And one of the persons, I think they may be here today, um, they, they had some, some, uh, uh, some complications with uh, the, uh, the, the, the COVID. I don't know if I can say that online. They may leave me. Who cares? And they needed prayer. And the individual told me, like, after we prayed, all the elders, it wasn't just Mike, it was all of us elders went up there and prayed over these people. The individual told me later, came back and said, all of the problems that this individual was having had gone away. Yahweh healed him. Not Mike. The Lord. Why? Miraculous. Why? Signs and wonders. Signs and wonders. Followed them. And it confirmed the work that Yahweh. You know why we don't see signs and wonders anymore? I wonder, and I'm not saying that I have the answer for this, the, the go-to answer. But man, I wonder, like, do we really take this serious? Do we guard our hearts? Do we guard the anointing that's on us? Do we guard the Holy Spirit? Like we don't quench him. What does it mean to quench him? You're at the gas station pumping gas. Some person drives in, right? They don't drive a nice car. You smell their exhaust. And all you can think about is the exhaust and the Holy Spirit's trying to talk to you. I said, go pray for them. Come on, somebody. This is powerful stuff, man. Everywhere they went, they proclaimed the Lord, and it was confirmed by signs that follow. When we have our focus on Messiah, there is evidence. There's fruit. And in this case, there were signs, i.e. there were healings, there were miracles. The only place that Messiah said that he wasn't, that miracles didn't happen was in his own hometown because people didn't believe him. And you know something? It's not just the pastor that gets to do that. It's not just the elders. Every person born again filled with the Holy Spirit has that same ability to heal, to pray for people, to counsel, to give wisdom, words of wisdom, right? To help other people. I gotta move because I don't run out of time. Praise the Lord God. Man, going into verse four. We're gonna miss it. We're gonna get four verses today. Praise the Lord. At the same time, <laughs> I love this. You can't make this up. God was testifying how? signs and wonders. Wait a minute. So the disciples went around proclaiming the gospel, and what happened? Signs and wonders. And in Hebrews, he's talking to the to, to these Jewish people in, in the Hebrew that are falling away. He said, look, when this was preached, at the same time, God was testifying by signs and wonders and various miracles. Who did the signs and wonders and miracles? It says God, right? And the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. I love that. I love it. That's why I've kind of been saying a lot the, the, the last few weeks I've been talking about. Like, I get the Torah, man, we need to walk in Torah. I'm very, like, very strict about that. But let's not just talk about the curse of the Torah. Let's talk about the blessing of Torah. There's a beautiful blessing when we walk in obedience. There's a beautiful blessing that happens when we put Yeshua and we declare him to everybody. There's a beautiful blessing that happens in that. Don't miss that. The evidence, the writing that the writer is presenting of the testimony of the Messiah is signs and wonders. This is kind of like, like God bragging. Like, this is what, when I see Yahweh do something in your life, when I see Yahweh do something in someone's life, whether it's provide for them, whether it's heal them, whether it's deliver them, whatever, whatever it's like God's on display and he's bragging. 
We need to look at blood now. We need to look at blood now. Notice it was God testifying with signs and wonders. There's so much evidence within the Torah of Yahweh's blessing on those who walk in obedience, who don't neglect it, who don't drift away. There's a blessing. Don't lose your blessing because you got spiritually lazy. The Bible can be read there. Let's not forget the signs and wonders also. He still does these amazing works. I'm almost done. As I get ready to close, I want to close with this. Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to go through this. Here we go. Here we go. Philippians 3.13. Brothers and sisters, listen. Listen to this. Listen to these words. I do not consider myself as having taking hold of this. I don't have full grasp of it yet. But this one thing I do. Forgetting what is behind, I strain toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal for the reward of the upward calling of God and Messiah Yeshua. Listen to this. This straining. He's straining. In other words, he's saying, I'm blocking everything out, and I'm yearning for what's coming. I'm yearning for Messiah. I'm yearning for what he has. I strain towards what is ahead. Therefore, let all who are mature, oh, this is good, have the same attitude. You want to know what your attitude needs to be? Right here. Right here. You know how you stop neglecting the word? You know how you stop drifting? Let your attitude be like this. Let your attitude be like this right here. And if you have any other attitude, you have a different attitude than anything, this also God will reveal to you. Nevertheless, let us live up to the same standard we have attained. How powerful is that, right? Where'd we attain it from? Messiah Yeshua. Let us live up to the standard that was given to us. Why? No more neglecting. No more drifting. Never stop pressing into Yeshua. Do not let anything draw you away. As followers of Messiah, we have an obligation to forget the things behind us and press on, press into the life and live up to the standard which was given to us through our Messiah. He is faithful. He is faithful. And if you are finding yourself right here today, if you find yourself in that place where, you know, you've drifted, and you're like, you know what? I need to get back to what's important. This is going to be your opportunity. Because we're going to pray. We're going to pray. And we're going to spend a little time. And this time, here's what I want you to do. Just you and Yahweh by yourself, where you're at right now. And I don't want no one moving around and running out. i got to go to the bathroom. You can hold it for five minutes. Come on. Don't miss this opportunity to let, the, let Yahweh speak into your heart. I love the word Teshuvah. It means repentance. But it's greater than just saying, God, I missed it. I'm sorry. It's to turn away from whatever is not distracting you. Turn away from the sin that so easily besets you. Turn away from that and turn back to Yeshua. Turn back to the Savior who died for you on the cross. Turn back to the truth that it's not about how you perform to make you right. It's trusting in him, having faith in him, and living out the life that he created you to live.